So um, I know we haven't actually formally met uh, like I'm Tony O'Calhoun with the National Reentry Network for Returning Citizens, and the advocacy coordinator here, um, facilitating, you know, changes for the website and Black Table Talk. And mm. doing this interview, um, trying to get your perspective as far as what your experiences have been as a returning citizen. And I know that you have done some work with the National Reentry Network for Returning Citizens, and you even received an award at our fundraiser um, back in December. I was there, I recall that happening. So if you first, would mind just first, just you know, saying who you are, what organization you're with, and what your work with the uh, National Reentry Network has been. Um, I am Dr. Carmen Johnson, and um, I am I, I, I have two separate roles. So I am the director of Court Wash Judicial Accountability with an organization called Life at Release that's in Maryland. And, um, and then I am also the founder of Helping Ourselves to Transform here in Washington, D.C. And then, of course, we're also registered in Maryland. And the reason why I, well, my little sister, who's nine years younger than me, forced Mm -hmm. me to start this um, Helping Ourselves to Transform a Reentry organization because of the issues that I went through when I first came home in 2018 as an impacted, um, you know, female that was wrongfully convicted, I was mentally messed up and, um, and not that I'm judging anyone, you mm-hmm. know, it's a, when you're emphatically innocent, it does something else mentally to you opposed to, Hey, I'm going to rob this bank. And this is how we are going to do it. We're going to do it at this time. We're going to do it at that time. Well, for me, that's not what the situation was. You know, I, I went to trial, I, you know, I ultimately lost, you know, I was arrested uh, roughly at trial, wasn't given the benevolence to handle my uh, personal affairs or my business affairs. So I was, I, I mean, I, I had a nervous breakdown. I actually, I had several, you know, being forced to take a plea, which I refused going through trial and watching all the fraud that was happening or the wrongful things that they were doing. Mm-hmm. And so when I, and, and I ended up at a prison camp in 2015, right after trial, And then in 2018, I came home and I felt like I was in a fishbowl and I kept telling everybody I'm I'm messed up. And they were just looking at the way I looked or something. I don't know what it was. And they were, you know, people when I would go to these different reentry organizations and um, they would say, well, we'll help you with your resume. Well, here is my resume. I got that. Well, we'll help you with your birth certificate. Well, I have my birth certificate. Well, we'll help you with your ID. Well, I have a driver's license. Well, we'll you know, well, we'll put you in this group setting for, you know, domestic violence. I'm like, well, that wasn't my issue. We'll put you, we got a group for, you know, drug addicts. Well, that's not my issue. Like, you know, they couldn't give me any type of help. And so, you know, I, I remember coming to the, the National Reentry Network. And so, and I had spoke to someone, it wasn't Mr. Stewart. And so apparently um, someone had talked to Mr. Stewart about me because they really wasn't sure, like, what do we do with this woman? Mm-hmm. And, um, and so they talked to him and then somehow I ended up on their mailing list. And so they had a meeting. And, um, and so well, he called me and said, Hey, we got this meeting coming up. He personally called me or something. And so I went to the meeting on zoom and then somehow or another, we started talking. He started, he became a mentor to me because okay. he, he, he knew that, well, this is an interesting situation. Like, you know, I, I grew up in a, a really good, you know, household, you know, I went to school, uh, you know, you know, I was a philanthropist, uh, a activist, a humanitarian, a practicing Buddhist. I mean, just my situation just didn't fit the average. And so for him, I think he just wanted to kind of know a little bit more about me, number one. And number two, he saw how broken I was. And so when we would first start doing our Zoom calls, I would just sit there and just cry. Like I was just so hurt. And the the, the pain of how 
the state of Maryland did me and the pain of how I'm thinking, I grew up thinking that, you know, our government represented something of purity and integrity, and that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And to find out the way I found out that this is not how my perception of how I found out that this is not this this is not the truth. This is what what is a lie is the truth, and what is the truth is a lie when you get caught up in that web and um, uh, of the injustice system. And it was really unfortunate. And so for me, I was carrying so much pain and hurt. And even though I I am emphatically innocent and been to the Supreme Court twice. I still went through that process. I still went through the process of being coerced into trying to get me to take a plea. I still went through the process of bending over, you know, spreading your butt cheeks. Let's be clear. Still went through the process of being diesel, going from place to place to place. I still went through the same process if anyone, whether they're guilty or innocent, Mm -hmm. I still went through that process. So here it is. I come home in 2018. And what was even more unbearable was the fact of the the embarrassment, even though I know and others know I'm innocent. It was still that shame and that embarrassment. You know what I mean? And so, Uh, yeah, yeah, Mr. Stewart. He knew that something was broken, but then he he also, I assume you would have to ask him, but he knew that it's something about this woman. I want to know more about her and what's really going on in her head. Mm-hmm. And then as we got to talking and, you know, and I told him about the 21 ways that I had wrote down how I was going to kill myself and and went through all of that. So this was a situation where he couldn't just give me to one of his counselors. He was like, OK, this, you know, I'm going to have to, you know talk to this mentor this woman yeah. and um and so it's been like two years and you know we meet on zoom we try to meet every week on zoom like every thursday or something like that unless something comes up with him right. or i and i remember him telling me you know i need to start my own nonprofit, and i'm like i can't do that and i'm not <laughs> ready for that and you know <laughs> and push me opposed to going to find a job. You need to start your own nonprofit. You need to tell your story. And then that's when I, you know, started writing my book and all kinds of stuff like that. And he was such a mentor. Now I look at him as a a big brother and, you know, and, you know, in December I had the opportunity to meet his beautiful wife and, and I just feel like part of their family, but without him, taking the time out saying, now, wait a minute, there's something interesting about her or something. Hmm. I, I need to, I need to, you know, figure out what's going on with this woman. And then of course he found out about the suicidal thoughts. And then he had to walk me through, you need to come back to who, who you was before this sabbatical started. You know, you, mm-hmm. you, you need to start your own nonprofit because that's what I was before, you know? And um, it was just an amazing that he was able to, bring me to where I am today. Of course, you know, I'm in mental health therapy every single Friday um, with my therapist for the last three and a half years, but it was something about him. And I guess because he's been through the process in the past, he was able to hone in on what my mental health therapist could not do. So once he was able to break through that barrier because of his experiences, then the therapist was able to come on in after Mr. Stewart had broke through the tar that was on my brain the, the from the injustice system. Once he was able to do that, then the therapy started with my therapist. Okay. That's, that is, that is an incredible story. So, I, I mean, it hasn't even been five years that you've been home. So, right. I, I mean, the, with all that you've accomplished, I, I, I just, it's, it, it's amazing. And, uh, and 
I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, you still, because it, like I said, it hasn't even been five years that you still carry, you know, some of those scars and some of that pain, but yet, you know, you're still, you're doing what it is that you're doing. And you've, you know, I mean, even, even though you may not have completely recovered from that, you've all obviously made a significant amount of progress since um, 2018. And yeah. since, um, you know, dealing with, you know, the, the Mr. Stewart and everybody, um, the, um, the award that you were given in um, December at the fundraiser, could you talk a little about that, if you don't mind? Um, the only thing that I can say about that is that I wasn't expecting it. Mm -hmm. And but I was absolutely honored. And when I found out at the last minute that I was um, going to receive an award um, the night before, you know, I get the phone call at 2.22 a.m. Mm -hmm. that my nephew, who's 23, had passed away. He was in a tractor trailer crash. Oh, and um, and so, of course, however, my family and I were we were in an uproar. We, we were up all night and stuff like that. But I knew that I had to be at this event, whether I was getting an award or not. I knew that I had to be at the event to support the man who has supported me, the organization who has supported me when it was nothing but darkness around me. Right. Because like I said, I was ready to check, check off the planet. Yeah. You know, so I knew I had to fight through my pain of my nephew and, 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 you know, and my, my sisters. And they was like, you know, you know, Jalen would want you to go and accept the award and, and, and support your mentor and and that's what I did. And, you know, when I gave my speech, I kind of choked up a little bit when I said my nephew just passed, you right. know. Yes. I, and um, but for me, that was important, but it was also important, you know, supporting my mentor as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and that just shows, you know, not not only how much of a profound impact that Mr. Stewart has had on, on your life, but also, you know, your your appreciation, you know, for what for what he's done to still be able to show up, you know, despite having just received that news. Um, that that is like I said, your your story is just amazing and incredible. Um, are you familiar with um the, some of the things that we do here as far as like the Black Table Talk? Um, I'm familiar with a lot of the things that you guys do. Uh, um, I know that you guys have um, like a circle or something like that, or you had a circle. And I'm not sure what type of, I don't know if it was a drum circle. It was some type of circle. I remember that when I first came there, um, I know that you guys um, help with housing. I know that you guys um, help with job placement and job readiness. Um, and of course, I would think that, you know, helping someone build their resume come with that and right. referring them to mental health. Um, you, you guys offer an array of services that are, are, are there. So I am aware of that. Okay. Yes, we, we also, um, we do a lot of advocacy as well. And uh, we put out some literature. The um, reason I, I bring it up, the Black Table Talk, is because there's um, a few questions that I was that I wanted to ask you that will pertain that may make it into the next issue of the Black Table Talk that I thought maybe you might have some good insight on. Um, our biggest topic for this issue is that it takes all of us. And so my, my uh, question, one of the questions I wanted to ask you regarding this topic is what, when you hear that phrase, it takes all of us, what does that mean to you on a personal level? What it means to me is the fact that, you know, like I couldn't have done this by myself. I mean, I was in such a dark place. I could not have done this by myself. I could not have gone from where I was um, when I first met Mr. Stewart to, to today. You know, I, I couldn't even hardly speak when I first talked to them, you know, talk to him. The, the, the prison system 
had taken my voice. The court right. system had taken my voice. You know what I mean? So I, I couldn't even function. I couldn't, e I couldn't, it, it, I, I couldn't function at all. Yeah. So, you know, and I went to several different organizations that they didn't know what to do with me. They're like, you know that okay oh well well you 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 hate call these people over here or call these people over there and I'm like and that made it even worse mm -hmm. that didn't happen when I came to your organization that did not happen whoever the person was that I met I, and I remember what he looks like I just don't remember his name and so uh, immediately apparently he gave my sister Stewart and said hey you know you you need to talk to this woman um, so to, for me, that was personal and for me, that was special. And for me, that means that your organization, y'all care and, 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 you know, we all know how busy Mr. Stewart is, but for him to take the time out to, I got to crack through whatever's going on in this woman's head in order for her to be able to heal. That was huge. Yes. And no one else did that. No one else did that. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, another question I wanted to ask you in regards to um, It Takes All of Us is that uh, often returning citizens, when they come home, and this is something that I myself have been guilty of before I got involved with this organization. Um, when we come home, we are so focused on our own reentry and our own needs and everything that we kind of we have a tendency to forget about, you know, the ones that, that are coming behind us who may need help or the ones that are still locked up and may need help. And being as though, you know, you started your own nonprofit and everything, what what opinions or advice might you have about what we can do? To, to get more returning citizens involved when it comes to advocacy and things of that nature, instead of everybody just coming out of prison and just going off on their own and doing their own thing and not dealing with all of the problems that we still have? You know, that's an interesting question because there are a lot of people that do come home and especially the ones that become successful at their craft, you know, right. that, you know, because it's, it's it's not a large number of us that are able to move in the right direction, you know, but hopefully the numbers will grow. Um, but it's really interesting be because I did reach out to um, a lot of different people that was in my, my shoes that, you know, that got pardons from the, the former president that, you know, you know, that that's in the work, in the, in the movement. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't get phone calls back and to be totally transparent, I think about the central five and, you know, in 2000, the, the beginning of 2019, I contacted all five of them because this is before I met Mr. Stewart and I contacted right. all five of them and I'm like, look, I'm, I, I don't know what to do. I'm hurting. I'm, I, I don't, I don't know what to do, you know, I'm innocent too. And, and I'm home now. And this is what I'm dealing with. None of them contacted me back except the one. And I think he may have been the oldest one. The one named Corey was the only one that responded to my email. And he said, sister, you have to keep going. And the other four did not respond. And it really, really affected me. And I talk about it a little bit in my book. Because here it is, they are on this huge platform yes, and they are able to help so many people. And so here it is, this little woman is reaching out to them saying, hey, I need help. I'm messed up. I, I don't I don't know what to do. I don't know what's going on in my head. I don't you know. And for the one who was abused the most, the one who's who's I, I think he spent more time than the others. I think that, you know, he. So he had it the hardest. I believe so. Yes. He was the he was the only one that responded back. And I still respect all five of them. Um, I send them love as a practicing Buddhist. I send them love. 
and have vibrations. But what I can say is I do not want to be that person. And they're not the only ones. I mean, I can go on. I can tell you a whole list. But what I but what's most important is that every email that come to me, every phone call that I get, every letter that I get from family members and loved ones from behind the wall is no way that I could just ignore them. That would never happen. And the biggest reason why, not not only because I'm a practicing Buddhist, is because I had someone like Mr. Stewart at y'all organization that gave me the opportunity to tell my story and for him to feel my pain and say, this woman needs a mentor. Right. You you know what I mean? So I have to give that back (laughs) to to somebody else. You know what I mean? Yeah. To be that example. And I can't worry about all these people that I contacted, including Alice Marie Johnson. I can't I can't be mad at them. They have their own reasons. They're busy. I could never be too busy. You know, I could never be too busy to not be able to respond to a phone call, email or letter from a loved one behind the wall or their family. It's just no way. I agree. That's, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, last thing I wanted to ask you is that due to your experience, you know, with um, legislation and policy now and everything like that, um, what would you, what, 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 if any methods, what methods have you experienced are best at helping, you know, returning citizens, other returning citizens who may be interested and being advocates for themselves or others, but have no experience? Like what methods do you feel are best um, in training or preparing those individuals to do basically what it is that you do? They should start writing down um, pieces of legislation that they would like to see passed or put into law. Um, And then they need to go back and research to see if there are any legislation that's out there already. And once they do that, a lot of times, eight times out of 10, this legislation is already out there. It's just not enforced. Or when elected officials, they they write a piece of legislation, then they move on to the next thing. And so Mm -hmm. that legislation is just sitting in the air. And then, you know, new people are coming around wanting to write new legislation when it's already legislation out there. Right. So. For me, is is making a list of what you want to see, how you know what changes you want to see as far as the injustice system or the prison system is concerned, and then doing your research to make sure that there is no other pieces of legislation that's out there, and then read through it, study it, and see if you can make any changes to it, or or get it to be enforced or, or whatever it you know whatever needs to happen. But the biggest thing is writing down what you think, researching, and then finding out what you need to do next. And, and, and building relationships with these elected officials. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I can't stand elected officials and da, 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 da. Well, I'm not an elect- elected official, so I got to put the ink pen to the paper and then I got to submit it. And, I, you know, of course, before my sabbatical, I, I, I knew a lot of senators and congressmen and congresswomen and, and stuff like that. And so once I got my mind right after Mr. Stewart forced me to start your own nonprofit, <laughs> so then I started making those phone calls and they're like, oh, I'm so glad to hear from you. I knew you were innocent. Okay, well, where were you when I needed you? But right. you know, nevertheless, I got this piece of draft legislation. This is what I need you to do. And that's where we are. Okay. All right. Well, I, I thank you very much, um, Dr. Jocelyn, you have a very powerful story, and I thank you for being, you know, bold enough and brave enough to share it here. Um, this is, I think, is going to be bene- very beneficial for a lot of people. So um, I, I thank you again for your time, taking the time out of your schedule to be able to do this, and I wish you all the best moving forward. I really do. Well, I thank you for all the work that you you all are doing in our community. And, and, and I thank you personally for what you guys did for me. Thank you. All right. Not a problem at all. Have a nice Have day. A day. All right. Bye.